Welcome to the Legacy Leaders Podcast. Are you doing the best for your client to help them create their legacy? Are you creating a plan that goes far beyond finances to help people ensure that it becomes the driving force behind all decisions? On this podcast, hosts Katie Beth Hand and Stan Miller will help you with growing your practice and your client's peace of mind. Together, they bring the best and brightest minds to share with you how to help your clients develop their best legacy. And now, here are your hosts, Katie Beth and Stan. Welcome to the Legacy Leaders Podcast with your hosts, Stan Miller and Katie Beth Hand. Our guest today is the founder and principal of Trimeran Financial Group, a family business advisor and author, Sandy, Sandy Pollock. Sandy, welcome. We are so excited to have you on the show. Well, I am delighted to be here, Katie Beth and Stan. Absolutely. So before we dive in, I would love for you to tell our listeners who may not know about what you do, tell them a little bit about your background and how you got started in this industry. Uh, great question. So I'm originally from Montreal. Uh, I'm a graduate of McGill University, and it was a 71-year-old man that had suggested that I enter the insurance industry because he said that the financial services industry was going through a huge transformation and he felt that uh, I was quite suited for that kind of world talking and pe with people because I was always very curious. And so I did some research and my next step because I have a Bachelor of Arts in Industrial Relations was to go to law school and be in the area of labor relations, but it turned out that I'm a really bad poker player and I can't lie and people can see my hand. So I decided to follow Harold's advice and launched uh, my career initially in Montreal uh, in the insurance industry, met the love of my life. He was in Philadelphia for a while and then had an opportunity to start a practice here in Ottawa, very convincing and persuasive gentleman who I am married to over 35 years now. And so we moved to Ottawa and I had to start a practice from scratch, although I commuted between the two cities and built up a practice here over um, the course of, I guess, the time that we moved here, we didn't know anyone and we had to renovate a house. And I was working with a lot of family businesses because it always intrigued me how a business owner could start from nothing except for perhaps hope and a prayer and a lot of grit and result in, you know, feeding other families, employing people, their accountants, their lawyers, their bankers, their employees. And I just wanted to learn about their stories. And the more that I, you know, met with them and met who, their other advisors, their lawyers and accountants and other professional advisors, I shared with them that really what my role was, was to help them make wise choices to protect what they've worked so hard to build. So our practice is twofold. We have an advisory practice where we work with families and business, multi-generational, to help them build roadmaps so that uh, families don't spend a lot of money on litigation law to sue each other because they're angry. And we also have another division, which is estate planning, to make sure that what they've built is, you know, organized in a way, and we work in a collaborative way with their professional advisors <clears throat> so that it hasn't just um, gone through not just the ravages of taxation, but also had the deep conversations with their family, uh, family members about values, not just valuables. So those are our two areas. Uh, we've got a great team here. And as long as I can help people uh, make a difference in their lives with intentionality based on what they want and why, I'm going to continue to do this for as long as I'm able and continue to build our team. That's fantastic. So you mentioned a quote that I absolutely love, and it's from your book, uh, Don't Leave a Mess. Talk to us about what inspired you to write Don't Leave a Mess, and then tell us a little bit about what our listeners could expect from reading it. Okay, so what could you repeat that question one more time yeah so what i'll break it down because i threw a couple yeah. at you at once yeah. so the first question is what inspired you to write a book you you've obviously got a lot going on with your financial group there's so many moving parts to that so what inspired you to take time out to write a book okay so in 2001 i was at a coaching course and there was a little exercise on pick the day that you're going to die, right? And so I picked at the age 85 and they said, all right, so if we added five more years to your life, what are the five top things that you would want to accomplish if you knew that you'd have great health and then all of a sudden you would die? One was to spend more time with the family. 
Another one um, was to do something in the community that was extended beyond just, you know, being involved in PTA and other, you know, sports that we would do and, and community things. The third one was to travel more. And the fourth one was to write a book. And I've been caught, I mean, I've done some crazy things in my li life in terms of adventures. And I've always kept saying, I got to write a book. Some of the stories that have been shared with me by so many people that I've met. And so when COVID hit, <clears throat> I, some, I got something in the mail and I, I looked at my husband, and I said, I think I want to write a book. And he said, well, you've been talking about this for 25 years. He says, why don't you just do it? And so I launched uh, onto this. And what I guess it was just like now my bucket list is done. I can get struck by lightning tomorrow and hey, I've done what I had to do. You know, I've got great relationships with the kids, traveled, you know, we're all good. Everybody in Oakwood seems to be healthy today. And I was hoping that this book would not just be different, but would make a difference in other people's lives. Because I was tired of seeing families um, broken and suing each other on things that happened when they were eight years old, right? It, and, and unintentional. And the first thing that they would say when they would have a, you know, I had a client that passed away that left a significant amount of wealth to three adult children was what were they thinking? Like, why didn't they talk about this? Or why didn't they plan or what, you know? And it was very interesting because initially in my career was all about, you know, tax planning, wealth preservation, you know, let's, let's work with the accountants and lawyers and create this plan. But nobody took the time to ask them why? Because <laughs> it's not just about, I mean, your children are not tax deductions, right? Trusts are not tax deductions. These are human beings that quite often are, A, they, they, they're unprepared, for the gift that that wealth builder might leave them, but also, you know, they aren't left with the values and the important stories behind the building of that wealth. So there's so much miscommunication and misunderstandings that create unnecessary conflict and split families apart instead of bringing them together. Absolutely. What what topics do you cover in your book? What could our listeners expect out of reading your book? So I think the what topics? So it's a guide. It's a guide which starts off. Uh, it's it's peppered with many stories and it's easy to read. So you don't have to be a PhD. You don't have to be an expert. This is a down to earth guide that helps people create um, and continue their journey of wealth building, if that's the case, or family business with intentionality so that they haven't left a mess behind. And the first chapter, I think, is probably the most important, which is called the price of silence. And that when families don't talk about money, it hurts everyone. And I think that we are brought up with certain beliefs about money, or uh, I read somewhere it's called money scripts, and some of those money scripts are unhealthy, such as don't talk about money, it's rude. It's rude, like, shh, 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 let's, let's not talk about it, you know? Um, and I have clients to this day that, I mean, I have one client who's sitting on, you know, $90 million of, of assets of real estate and things, and his children have no clue what he has. And I keep, and so we, we got him at least, I called it, we put a, a bandaid on a hemorrhage to write a letter to his children and, and his second spouse as to why he's done his will this way. But I said, you know, this is a bandaid on a hemorrhage here. Like we have to really have a meeting so that they are prepared and they understand the hard work effort and the why behind this. So I think that first uh, section really dispels like why don't people talk about money or, or getting their wills done? Oh, because if I don't talk about death, it's not gonna happen to me, right? Like that's, oh yeah, it's bad, bad, bad. Well, I can tell that person or anyone with 100% certainty we're all gonna die. I am I, I rather buy a lotto ticket, you know, I wouldn't, I would rather say, what are the odds? The odds are 100% versus a lotto ticket, which is like a speck of dust. And I think that if we can just dispel those myths, and some people that have read the book call me back and they say, oh, I'm myth number four, thank you, I'm running to my lawyer right now, we're getting our wills done, you know, and then I know that I've made impact. So the first one is that um, we talk about values, not valuables. And I think that that's really key because initially when someone builds a business, they, they are big future thinkers, but, and they have grand aspirations with, with basically a, a thought and a prayer, and maybe they've mortgaged their homes. But as they've journeyed through life and built their wealth, they haven't taken the time to think about the implications. 
of what if they happen to walk out. And most often than not, entrepreneurs are really bad at listening, right, to people telling them what to do. They are the I will do. And so it's how do you get them to connect with their success to communicating with their children about not just, you know, how well they've done, because believe me, these kids sometimes feel often dwarfed um, and insecure because they think that they are these powerhouses and they never really take into account the trials and tribulations and failures that that entrepreneur had experienced. So it's, it's providing a more humanistic approach to planning and not just about taxes and not just about strategies, but what do you want to do with what you've built? A, acknowledge it, which quite often they don't want to. Like we'll show someone their net worth and they'll say, put that paper away, that's not me. And I'll say, no, 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 that's, uh, you're right. I see who you are. You know, you give to charities, you're very generous to people, you're a great dad, but guess what? This is yours and you have to own this and figure out how are you going to, because you can't take it with you in your box, right? You, they're not going to just kind of throw a whole bunch of commercial real estate in your coffin. It won't fit, number one. And number two, there's tax authorities and other people waiting in line for their piece. But really, it's about, think about what this can do for your family, for your community, for charity, and, and understand that wealth, although it might be more than what you had anticipated of building, because initially they just wanted to feed their families, right? And they were also probably very unemployable because they weren't good at people bossing them around. But understand that money can soften the edges of life for your children. But if you can give them the directions and, and talk to them about, you know, intentionality and values and grit and share with them your moments where, you know, life didn't look so easy, right? That will help them so that they have discernment and clarity onto what they will do with the gift that perhaps you've bestowed upon them. Absolutely. Stan, I know that you loved every, I feel like I'm talking to Stan when I'm talking to you, Sandy. What, what questions do you have for Sandy about her practice or about the book? Well, lots of questions, but I just want to say, I've really been enjoying listening to you because I love hearing those outs and abouts that are just the dead giveaways of, of, of your, uh, you know, that, that that you're that you're Canadian and uh, you know you can you, you couldn't hide it you know and and you shouldn't hide it so uh, um, I'll, I'll, so I, I just I, I'm just enjoying you know listening to listening to the way those words come out of your mouth I'm curious it, it, you know I understand about the book and and I certainly you know we've talked before I know where your head is and you know we're in really the same place in terms of where we want to move our client relations I'm really curious to hear you tell me uh, some of the, like the specific ways you introduce these ideas to clients. How do you, how do you connect with a client and bring this up and introduce these, I want to say the, this non-financial dimension of, of planning to a client just in the ordinary course of your relationship as a financial advisor? How do you do that? Great question. We have a process and, and the process is as follows. Usually a client gets recommended to us by either an accountant or a lawyer or another client. Um, sometimes even they'll get the book and they'll just look at the cover and say, I wanna meet you, right? Cause it's such a, don't leave a mess. Oh, I'm gonna tell you a story. Can I share a story with you about a mess that my friend's brother left? Uh, but we have what's called an initial meeting and the initial meeting, there's no fee. It's just, are we the right fit for you? And in that initial meeting, I call this a you, me, and us. So we're here to learn about the client, like what, what brought them here, right? Um, I've got over 30 years experience in this world, uh, working and collaborating with professionals and, and many business owners and family members. But <clears throat> tell me a little bit about your family, what you be, you know, your history, what's on your mind, so you can just unpack. Once they've done that, we go through how our process works. And we have a process called um, the strategic wealth process. And that is uh, an, a series of steps where we'll start with um, what we call our discovery meeting. And we spend a lot of time, a client has a laundry list, they have to bring in all their stuff. I mean, I had one business owner, they brought in all their documents and papers in a laundry basket. That's how much stuff they had. And then we took the laundry basket and we literally put it at the corner of the conference room. I said, okay, that's not important. 
let's talk about you what and and we would have them go through a series of you know questions or exercises about what their relationship is with money like what's important to them about money what does it mean and really digging under the iceberg like it's not about oh money is not important i didn't ask you if money was important i was asking you about what's important about money to you and initially you'll get answers like oh it's security financial security oh, okay well why is that important oh well you know we were brought up with very little and you know okay and and what else and and at the end of the day when we go through money means so many different things with different people so we have that money conversation so that they can understand that money isn't just the dollars and cents monies are time um, vacations with families trips giving to organizations that matter to them and at the end of the day a lot of these people it's about control and freedom right and freedom about what and we really do a, a deep dive into their own relationship and how they grew up did they talk about money at the kitchen table why not oh you know it's a bad thing really why is it a bad thing oh you know what i don't know why it's a bad thing you know mom and dad just said Shh, it's rude it's rude right and uh, we just did a presentation with the alumni learning uh, consortium and we found some statistics about what people like to talk about and over 50% love to talk about current events, you know, love to talk about health, um, but less than, I think it was 40% wanted to talk about money, but we did a deeper dive and we looked at demographics and people in the 20 to 35 love to talk about money, big majority, like over 60%. As soon as you got moved along the spectrum to the older demographics, to the boomers, 25% like to talk about money. But what's interesting is the majority of the wealth, we're talking trillions here, are in that group. So they got it and they don't want to talk about it. So mm -hmm. we get them to feel comfortable talking about money. Um, so that's the first thing we do is give them what we call healthy scripts so they can understand that it's okay. The other thing um, that we do in our process is we ask them, well, what do they want to do? Like what's important to them in for their children? And they're able to unpack some of the messiness, and I call it the realities of families. Families are messy and you have to embrace it. It's kind of like when you have a five-year-old and you know you give them water, give them paints, and they'll paint everywhere. You know, I'll, I'll give you a ex good example. In our house, we have under this stair a little room when our daughter was young, um, and it has a little door in the basement. And I told her she could do whatever she wanted. This was our youngest. The other two are like 10 and 12, so she was five. And she she wrote on the walls. She put stickers. So when my nieces would come over for Thanksgiving, they loved to go in this little room. There was a little desk. There's stickers. There's a whole bunch. Of, it was like a little world onto itself. And they could do what they wanted. There were no rules. Well, my sister rents a cottage in Mont Tremblant, which is a, a ski area in Quebec, and she rented a house that had this attic. And she goes upstairs to check on her daughters, and they're writing on the walls, right? Because they thought that was, you know, the right thing to do. Now, what does this have to do with money scripts? Well, we're given certain permissions on what to talk about and what not to talk about. And I think that when we can, I guess, point out to our clients that having money conversations is actually healthy and important on their own journey towards building, uh, protecting, and gifting their legacies, then they feel more comfortable. So that's a big part. We spend more time, I would say, in discovery and understanding the relationships with their children. Are there children that have special needs, special addictions? How can we connect them with the right people so that they don't feel that if we don't talk about it, it won't, it, it's not there, right? It takes a lot of courage. So we have a lot of courageous conversations, a lot of mm -hmm. empathy, compassion, and no judgment because every family is unique and every family has its unique set of dynamics. So that process, once we get through that, we also find out what is it that they really want? And really, you know, they, they learn that leaving money to your children <clears throat> might not have been intentional, but they have it and they want to do it. But how do they do it in a way that makes sure that they're not spoiling their kids, right? Uh, do you want to wait until you're dead or do you want to soften the edges a bit by helping them out with their children's education or by helping them out with a gift when they purchase a new house? We talk about things like um, marital agreements, right? Marriage contracts. What's the importance of it? It's not about, oh my God, it's a terrible thing, but to explain it in a way that says, listen, you have a business that employs 150 people and you've just, because of this tax 
planning that your accountant and lawyer put together leaves all these shares to your children if that person gets divorced do you really want you know to have to sell the shares when your business is not liquid and so we say we can describe the fact that that child will benefit from dividends or whatever but that everything that that couple brings into the marriage is theirs to share but the purpose of having a matrimonial agreement is more to protect the business and the families that they serve. And when you have those conversations, marriage contracts don't seem like this horrible, like, oh my God, what am I supposed to do? Bring it up the day before they get married or here, sign here, sign here, sign here. Oh, that's a great way to teach your children how to build long-term relationships, right? I don't think so. So we have all these conversations and then we help them prioritize because really in planning, it comes to down to four areas. There's tax, there's legal, there's financial, and there's risk. And after we've done our report um, based on what their goals are, where they are today, and what the gaps are in their planning, we point out those gaps, we make recommendations, and more often than not, we're sending them back to their accountants and lawyers and sharing the reports as well with those advisors. But the other thing that we're doing is we're saying, where do you wanna start? I'm not gonna should all over my clients you should do this and you should do that. No, 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 it's, it's from a place of aspiration and not a place of fear. And I think that that is why probably our, pro, our process takes a little bit longer because when the client makes a decision, whether it's for an investment, because we refer them out to portfolio managers, insurances are, are um, another part of our core, industry, our core business, but when they make a decision, whether it's dealing with risk, law, tax, you know, or investments, they're doing it from a place of strength and a place of where they want to go and why. And I think it's a lot easier than when you do an annual review, because sometimes we also say, look, this isn't just like a one shot deal. Life's a journey. Things change. People die. People get divorced. People marry. They marry again. You have children. So it's really important to make sure that the decisions that you made a year ago or two years ago or five years ago are still relevant to where you are today. And I, I can attest to the fact that who I was when I was in my 20s, like I just, you know, if you had a pulse, I would talk to you, right? Seriously, I was, I just knew that I had to see people and eventually good things would happen. It was just based on hope. But what I also realized was that I felt that, you know, in your 20s, you want to know everything. And over the course of your journey of helping people, you realize that you can't know everything. But if you are curious and if you're alert and if you're responsive and if you're resourceful to say, I don't know, but I'll find the answer, I'll find the who that we need, it empowers your client and it also comforts them to know that no one knows everything and that that whole idea of constant review based on where you're at, whether you're a young family, a family with teenagers, with children that are launched or become a grandparent, all these things, um, really have an impact on the decisions that you make in your overall planning. So I hope that answers your question. Stan. It's a really good answer. Let me drill a little bit deeper into it and find yeah. out. In your process, do you, do you have a way to connect with the next generation of family members as, as part of that process? Does that happen occasionally in the work you do? Uh, more often than not, particularly in family business, I would say. Uh, and the reason why is because the scenarios that seem to play out is there's more often than that there's at least one family member involved in the business right so it's um what type of rules do you think you need like you can't why would you leave a business and challenging their thinking if everybody's equal and you have one one child that's putting their heart and soul has been mentored by you why would they be accountable to some siblings that all they're concerned about are dividend checks so what we, we end up doing is asking them, listen, let's, when we do discovery, particularly with a family business, like we, the one that we have tomorrow morning, <clears throat> when we launched on our process, we had individual one-on-one -on -one meetings with all generations to get their perspective because everyone, and that takes a lot of time, right? However, it's not for free. And the client has to understand that if they really want to invest in having a positive outcome based on what their ex expectations are or not, they're gonna have to you know, invest with us so that we can get the true story because everyone has a different lens that they look at the family, the business, wealth, and to truly uh, come up with a report that 
is in, that's meaningful, we, um, we discover underlying themes, such as financial fluency, you know, are your children financially, do they have the financial literary literacy skills to make the right decisions? Uh, do they understand that perhaps you do want to leave them shares of the business, but not the active business, it could be the, the part of your family business enterprise that has real estate. So a family business enterprise has many components. It has an operating company or companies. It could have financial assets. It could have heirloom assets. It could have a cottage or a compound. And when we lay all that out to the client, then, you know, and also get it from the perspective of the children, it actually brings them closer together because those underlying themes, um, I had one client who, um, you know, read my book, we're talking three generations in the 80s, 50s and 20s. And she just finished uh, reading another book and she said, you know, Sandy, because uh, they're getting a dividend check, right? And they're, they're not prepared. And I have, you know, we have these family meetings and, and I suggested that she write a letter to her grandchildren about, you know, well, what was the, what was the purpose of this gift? And she starts it off with, well, you don't really deserve this gift. <laughs> uh, and it was great because that's the way the grandmother is. However, this is, and she wrote this beautiful letter. Um, I thought it was, you know, at the beginning, but it was interesting. And she talked about, you know, the, the risks that they took and the sacrifices, and she wanted them to use this money wisely, but also to give to charity because that was a very important part. She's very faith. She has a, a deep sense of God and, and gratitude. Anyway, so she just finished reading this book, The Myth of the Silver Spoon. And I just spoke to her yesterday and she said, Sandy, she says, I think I'm gonna put a postscript on this letter. And I went, really? She says, yeah, I was reading that book and I didn't realize that they felt such pressure. And, and now it's making me understand, you know, that I said, yes, that they're living under your and your late husband and your, your daughter's shadow of success, and they don't even know where to begin. And she said, yeah, I'm writing a PS and I'm, and I'm gonna, you know, and at the end she told her grandchildren that she loved them, but that PS will probably be the most profound and impactful part of that gift beside the check. And, and these grandchildren, respectful, uh, gracious, humble, but confused. So I think that when you're dealing with inter and we've met with all generations to get their perspective of how we can help them. So I think uh, it's important. I usually, I always insist that spouses, we see both of them for any kind of planning because I call the, uh, the spouse, the CEO, the chief emotional officer who really makes the decisions and needs to have a voice at the table. Uh, I have no problem telling very successful multimillionaires that they would be nothing without a strong and supportive spouse beside them. And they look at me and I say, so you make sure you kiss her toes when you get home tonight, you know, or we, we kind of joke about things like this and, and having laughter. And um, so I think that bringing in as many family members as you can during the discovery process will help, particularly when you're talking about significant wealth that's being transferred uh, on an intergenerational basis. And so I would guess, you know, I love that process. And I would surmise that you find that whenever your clients pass away, and some do, right? The, you know, clients do from time to time pass away, really? right? Uh, really? Yeah. Uh, I've heard that the mortality rate in Canada is 100%. Yeah. What's it like in the U.S.? It's 100% also. Yeah. Really? Oh, so, we have commonalities uh, here. We do have that in common, don't we? Yeah. So, uh, so I'm surmising that that when you build these relationships with the next generation, that there's a fairly high probability that you continue your business relationship with the next generation also. Are you finding that to be the case? Absolutely, which is why we're building our team here. Because I, I, I'm very comfortable telling 25 and 30 year olds, you know, maybe you don't want to talk to me because maybe you're putting me in the same vintage as mom and dad. So we're going to bring another member of our team and I and, and we'll say, go take out so and so's grandson for lunch or grandchild, get to know them, get to understand them and hear their perspective so that we can serve our clients better. Because at the end of the day, Stan, it is about serving others. It's not about self-serve. It is about serving others. 
it, it just turns out the way the way life works, right? Is that when you really authentically serve others, it actually also does work for you. Absolutely. There, someone once told me a very actually he's still a mentor today. He's in his eighties, and he said to be in the financial services industry, you have to love people and you have to love money, but you have to love people first, and the money will come. And I think that if you are genuinely interested and authentic about the uh, the journey of the wealth builder, the challenges, the opportunities, the moments where they just call you and say, can I ask you a quick question and, um, and know that you can serve them, then the recommendations that you base, if they're real recommendations based on the client's goals, everybody wins in the end. It brings the level of water up for, for everyone. And I can give you a story, which if you'd like to hear a story of a client who um, second marriage, bought a cottage, a beautiful cottage um, on the, the Rideau Lake here, uh, I'm sorry, Rideau River. And he calls me up, uh, second marriage, and he's calling me to tell me that he purchased this cottage, very, very expensive cottage, and he's uh, putting in his will that he's going to leave the cottage to his two children from the previous marriage. And I said, oh, I said, so do these two children come visit you at the cottage? He goes, no, 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 it's my wife and she loves it. And we have wonderful moments there on the weekends. The kids don't even want the cottage. I said, so why did you buy the cottage? Oh, because we've got to get away from work and business. And Sandy, it's just like a piece of heaven. We just enjoy it. I said, okay, so you're buying this cottage and you're creating fond and treasured memories with the woman of your life, right? And then you're going to die and you're going to leave that to children who don't even want to be there and really don't care about that. Is that really what you want to do? Just asking. And he went, Oh, and he's leaving significant wealth to the children. And he went, okay, Sandy, I got to go. And I said, is everything okay? He says, yeah, I have to call my lawyer and, and make sure that the cottage is left to my wife. All right. And it was just, you know, the lawyer was ready. Like, okay, who do you want to leave it to? Okay. Let's check the box. And nobody asked him why, and nobody right. asked him that purpose. Now, did that result in any kind of planning transaction? No, but you know, that's really what a true advisor is about in whatever field that you're in, is, is having the courage to ask the deeper questions, which are the why questions. And I think we're missing that a lot in, in the financial services industry. It's all about the how and the what, and not about the why. Yeah, and as an estate planning attorney, I can promise you we're missing it on the estate planning side, the estate planning attorney side, too. I believe that. At one point, I had a client. We were in this big boardroom, and this lawyer was talking about this spousal trust to set up so that when he died, the money would go in this trust for the spouse, and when she died, it would eventually go to his children. And he's sitting in his chair, and he's squirming, but he doesn't want to say anything. And I know what he's thinking. He's thinking, no, 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 no. I, I don't want my, my daughters who don't get along with wife number two to wait a hundred years. I, I, I wanna make sure they get something. So I ended up taking the accountant and lawyer out to lunch and saying, listen, there's tax and there's control. I said, so if all we do is focus on tax, he's lost control. Why don't we let leave a little tax on the table right? Some leakage, you can take care of that with life insurance, right? And give him the control and tax. And the, the lawyer went, oh, I didn't know that. He said, this is a great idea. He redid the plan. The accountant looked at me and said, Sandy, this has been your client for three years. And he's been my client for 23 years. And you know more about him in the three years that you've been working with him than I have in the last 23. And thank you. And they redesigned the plan according to making sure that the children got the legacy that he wanted them to have, but also making sure that his, his second wife was, was well provided for and taken care of. So there, there's an example of, yes, I know we all, we all are at fault in some way or another. We own it, we own it, but we can avoid it and we can do better, Stan. I sincerely believe that. I love it. I love hearing your stories. We are so on the same page. Katie Beth knows that. Terrific. I wish we had all day to have these conversations. I do too. I do too. I do wish we had more time for questions, but before we go, you've been in this business for over 20 years, Sandy. And so for our listeners that are listening, if you could give them just one piece of advice, what would that be? 
aside from buying the book, don't leave a mess. Right. Great advice. Such good advice. <laughs> uh, I think the first thing is start having conversations. Mm -hmm. Be courageous, have those courageous conversations and you will be astounded at how much closer that brings you together to your family and what you thought they thought is not that at all. And there is a deep amount of love, respect, admiration and gratitude that has not been expressed by your children or grandchildren because you haven't given them a safe forum to talk about these things. And it'll just create bit greater bonds. I mean, the, the goal of this book, Katie Beth, was to take a state litigation and put it back with the industry of the buggy whips. Okay, remember the buggy whips before the automobile, right? Booming, booming. And then the automobile came along, can't find a lot of buggy whips. That's how they used to measure the American economy. Well, I think estate litigation is a huge industry because these conversations aren't happening. And these are deep conversations about values and not valuable. So that would be my one piece of advice is it's okay to have these conversations. It might feel a little uncomfortable, but it's like riding a bike. When you first got on those two wheels, it was a little shaky, right? And remember when your mom and dad kind of just let you go and you went, well, it's the same thing. So don't procrastinate, have it now and have those conversations today. Thank you. An excellent <laughs> bit of wisdom. Go ahead, Stan. I was just gonna say, you're an inspiration. I'm, gl I'm, I'm glad we chatted today. <laughs> thank well, you. thank it you. Been fun. It has been fun. Well, thank you everybody for joining us. This has been the Legacy Leaders Podcast with your hosts, Stan Miller and Katie Beth Hand. Our guest today was Sandy Polak. And for more information on Sandy and the work that she does, you can visit trimarianadvisory.com and we will link that for you in the show notes. You can also find Sandy on LinkedIn and her book, Don't Leave a Mess, is available on Amazon. Sandy, thank you so much again. It is always a pleasure to speak with you and to hear what you are out there doing in the world. Katie, Beth, and Stan, it has been a delight joining you here today. And I also want to pipe in that for those non-readers out there, we also have an Audible edition that you can listen to as you're driving or even an e-version. So we've got all the types and it's a lot of fun to hear. So thank you again. It, it has been a real honor and a pleasure. Perfect. Thank you. You've been listening to the Legacy Leaders Podcast with Katie, Beth, Hand, and Stan Miller. For more information on them and the show, please visit PinnacleLegacyLaw.com. If you like what you've learned today, do share the program with your friends and subscribe wherever podcasts are found.